ask you to turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew, the fifth chapter. We're going to pick up reading in these Beatitudes of how he really says that we are the salt of the earth and we are the light and the world. And you'll notice that in verse 14, ye are the light of the world. And he illustrates that by saying a city set on the hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a lamp and put it under a bushel. But on the stand where all oh, it's in a the room, they're able to see that light as they are in the house. Even so, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. It's a familiar passage. After dealing with the fact that we are persecuted for righteousness sake, that we can rejoice in those difficult times. But it tells us what our relationship to the world is. We're to be the salt of the earth. But what we see here is I'm a light unto the world. And how is that illustrated? A city set on a hill cannot be hid. We were in a boat running around the waters there. That might be a nice evening, wouldn't it? You couldn't avoid that city. He didn't say you're like a city set on a hill. You're the light of the world. And he says a city set on a hill cannot be hid. So you can't hide your light. And whenever do you need a light? You know, you may have a flashlight and your car's broken down. And the lady says, I got a light, I'm reading my novel. No, I've got a flat, help me. You want to shine your light on what is needed at the moment. There's a contact. There is a, there's coming into the presence of. And that's the world. We don't go into a cave or a monastery or separate ourselves from the day-to-day relationship with the world. We would have to go out of the world, Paul was saying. And yet, we're not to have fellowship with fornicators. Those are brethren, and we have to separate from them, but not the people in the world. And then how do you be a light if you put a bushel over it? That might be good ambiance, I guess, if you want a, a kind of a dinner and you want to kind of keep the lights low. But the light needs to shine to everybody in the room. That's the whole point that Jesus is making. You don't do that if you want your light to shine. Well, I want your light to shine. You shine your light before men that they may see your works that are good and glorify your Father who is behind it all. That's our, it's our relationship. So my question is, how do we live in this world, in contact with this world, and influencing it for good? We're keeping the corruption, or salt, but we're shining light. We shine the light of the gospel, as we saw this morning. The devil doesn't want people to see the glory of Christ in the light of the gospel. So he tries his way of keeping that word from being proclaimed. And he does a good job. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. They probably won't receive that. It's hard. It, you're not going to get them to study with you, so we don't try. We don't try. No, we're, we're all involved. We prayed today, to, this evening, to be in contact with trying to teach people the word. So we're in this world. You and I all know that. But how does one do that without being of the world? That's my question this evening. Because Jesus is praying unto the same Jesus that said, we're in this world, we're defected for good. As he prays for his apostles and those who would believe on the word through those apostles, he tells us in verse 15, they are not of the world even as I am not of the world. So you're going to set him apart. Set him apart by that truth. Thy word is truth, and so forth. And so we see in verse 15, I pray that thou shouldest 
not take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world. So he says, I don't want you to take him out of the world, Father. Leave these apostles here, but you keep them from the evil one. That's the devil and his associates that he may use. That we're to be kept from that trap of the, of the snare of the devil. And we're to do that. So that's one side of this. Verse 21, we're to be united as brethren. So what? We're, he's not taking away our influence on the world because he says that they may all be one even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world may believe that thou didst send me. We're not holding back from the world, and we're not being involved with the world. We're involved with the world. We're trying to save the world. We're trying to show by our unity as the Father and the Son are united in the Godhead. When they see that unity, they'll know that you, you sent me. There'll be a, a, great, a, a great picture of what the unity ought to be in his authority. Indeed, Jesus is behind it all. So that's a dilemma. That's a, a role that you and I have to walk. And it may seem very narrow. It may seem kind of choppy. It may seem kind of difficult. How do you do that? Where I'm going to influence them for good, but I'm not of them. I'm not of them. I'm sanctified from sin. I'm sanctified from the things that are evil. I'm not living that route, but I'm living it right with the people around me in this world. And we don't want to be caught up in that. I want us to look at how we can do that. And just ask, well, God has spoken. His word is there. And I ask you, as we look at these passages... What has he bound? What has he demanded? Because that's following him. That will be different from the world. And I just pick a few that we see in the Sermon on the Mount. Men are to be careful of what they stare at and what they look at. You're not to look upon a woman to lust after her. If you do, you've committed adultery already with her in your heart. Already if you've done that because you've sold yourself out. That's what you're thinking about. And you've done that in your heart. So here is my heart. Here are my eyes. Here are my thoughts. All dealt with, and I know exactly how I'm not going to be like the people of this world. And boy, when you take care of those three, you'll be different from men of this world. They're not even bashful of what they look at and what they think. But that's not you. You run elbows, elbows. You work with them on the job. You go to school with people like this. We're in the world. But this is where we draw the line. We know he has bound that. And so I ask you, as you live your life, what movies do you allow yourself to see? Uh, we don't have to go to a theater to go to a movie. We can just bring it right on in our home. And we can see all sorts of movies that we want to see. We can be in motel rooms and we can order movies that we want to see. And I'll be right there on that TV string. Your character is what you are when nobody else is looking. And sometimes the world will say there's no problem with that. They don't have a problem with the movies they see. Do you? Do you? Things are becoming so bad that maybe these others aren't so bad after all. We, we kind of compare what's around us instead of the character of what that movie's about. We give excuses. There, there weren't too many bad scenes in that movie. Too many. They didn't say too many bad words. And we kind of justify ourselves. Uh, well, are we being like the world? Are we careful for what we call entertainment? And a private showing in your home on a Friday night, on a date night, 
with your husband or your wife or what kids, young people look at. And we realize, no, I'm going to draw the line. Is, is, is it because men rates it? It's, it's PG, it's whatever, and therefore that's going to be our standard? Good luck. Good luck with that, because sometimes those ratings, you know good and well, they're, they, they're, they're not reflective of God. What do we have bound it? I want to protect my eyes. I don't want to be looking on a scene where it causes me to lust after someone. I'm not going to be part of that. I'm not going to look at that. I'm not supposed to be looking on a woman, but if she's in a motion picture, it's okay. There's just no way to justify that. But sometimes we don't even think about the movies we see. What does God actually bind? In Matthew 5, 21 through 22, he's dealing with the fact you've heard it was said, thou shalt not murder, and God goes to the heart. He goes to the heart that would cause someone to... Murder someone. And that's where you reflect upon the fact that you have a contempt for their very being in existence. They are fools. We'll call them raka, which was a term for, uh, for the idea of, of just despising someone. But there in Matthew 5, 21, 20, 22, you ought to be angry with your brother. You'll be in danger of the judgment. Whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, which is a, a word of contempt in that day, shall be in danger of the council. Whosoever shall say, thou, thou fool, shall be in danger of the hell of fire. He gets real serious about that one. It's not that God doesn't ever call anybody foolish or that we act foolish, but it's the idea of being a fool, and it's where we get our word moron. That is having so much contempt for a person, it wouldn't take much to just get them out of the way. Murder. And God is dealing with that. I tell you, he binds that attitude of heart where we get to the point that you don't deserve to breathe the breath I'm breathing and I, I will murder you. I will put you out of existence. What kind of television shows do we watch? Television shows. I know those movies are bad. But television, that's, that's okay, isn't it? Yeah, TV, yeah. Get the news, get the weather, get the sports. We've seen how television has gone through the years. Do you trust your local newscast people? Do you trust your national newscast people? Where do you get your news? And all around cable, you can watch all sorts of, of shows, television shows. But you can watch a lot of violence on the television shows. I grew up, cowboys and Indians. That's not even politically correct anymore, is it? And does that make you racist? No. But the violence today is that you don't have a right to be breathing my air. And over the years, it's just got senseless killings just so they can grab an audience. And there's an audience there that likes violence, likes killing, just for the sake of killing. And we can put our video games right on our television screen. And our children can grow up with that type of mentality. Where do we draw the line? We, what did he say? And when I find that in modern technology, that will affect how I live. I'm in the world, but I'm not to be of it. And I'm supposed to keep myself separated from that. Ephesians 5, 4 speaks about speech. That idea of foolish talking, idea of, of coarse jesting, as some versions have it, talking in jest, filthy speech. That's all around us. I remember being in the west, west, west part of town a few years ago and just sitting in a restaurant and elementary kids were coming in, cursing more than I remember ever took place with high school kids. Just filthy talk among younger and younger people. That's the world. 
The world needs saving. The world needs influence. We don't go hide in a hole somewhere, but we recognize the type of speaking we have. Are we edifying? Are we just tearing down? Are we telling jokes that you get the impression that, well, if I go there, that's not a very clean joke. But I didn't say it. You infer from my joke that way, but that's not me. You've got the dirty mind. And just silliness. And you see it on the job, you see it in school and all those sorts of things. So we realize God is behind that my speech needs to be pure, needs to be uplifting, it needs to be edifying, and not taking one's mind into the gutter with filthy talk, dirty jokes, implied thoughts that are not clean. What kind of music do you listen to? Is it wrong to listen to music that's modern? What style, genre do you want of music? I like country music, I like hip hop, I like this, I like that. Does God bind the styles of music? Does he bind the, t the type of music you like? You like rock and roll, you like country? Sometimes they blend together and all of those things. Is this a style that God's interested in? What did he bind after all? Here we have modern technology and we have a book from the first century that didn't know any of these things in their world that they lived in. But God gave us a book that still tells us, I am to be in the world, but not of the world. I want to hear my music. What's the character of your music? Is it filthy talk? Is it coarse jesting? Does it speak of violence? that you're exalting as being okay in certain types of songs today? Is it speaking of thoughts that are not clean? I'm sure you've had this experience growing up. You liked the beat and you liked the music. And you didn't know what the words meant. You didn't care. It just sounded good and it, it, it just got to move my feet and all that sort of I just like it. And then you realize, what are they saying? That's not good. Do you make a decision then? Or has that become your all-time favorite? You just don't say the words. And we have to make judgments. We have to judge righteously on judgments. But God has not bound the different types of things and the media and the very things that we have that we can grab information. We have information instantaneously at our fingertips. You can look up almost anything. And find the answer. How old is that newscaster on television? I'll tell you, I'll tell you how many times he's been divorced, too. Thank you, Kathy. She, she can look at it real quickly. Not that she spends her time doing all that. She helps me. And everything we're interested in. How, long, how many times has that guy been married? Four? Wow, okay. And he hadn't got three sentences down. But that's how quick we could get things. And, and they may be right and they may be wrong, but... You are informed. But what is the character of our speech? What is the character of our heart? What's our heart dwelling upon? How are we using our bodies? And really, before that, how are we using our eyes and our minds? That's, God has bound that. And we can do that in any society we have. Worship is different in a lot of churches. You study with people and they're wanting, they're going to a church and you know good and well they don't worship the way that we do here. And you realize there's a difference there. Will that be something that we can talk about? So look at the sign today. There's a blending worship before you have contemporary worship today. I don't know what that blending stuff is. It wasn't traditional, it's blending. I'm sure they're, they're changing it as the people who they want to reach in this world kind of indicate that that's what they like. 
But when we speak about, as we've done this evening, worship in song, has, what is God bound? What has he said? What has he said? That said, this is the type of music I want when you worship me. Ephesians 5, 19. You speak to one another. We did that. We're speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We didn't sing one secular song tonight or in our worship. We don't do that. But they're spiritual songs. They're psalms. A lot of them taken from the psalms that we have written. But they're hymns, hymns of praise. We praise God. We praise Jesus. We sing with our hearts full of joy. That's the theme tonight. And we make melody... We pluck the heart's strings because the word solo there is used in the Old Testament of plucking the strings of a harp. In the New Testament, it's plucking the strings of the heart, your mind. It's where your spiritual worship comes from, and mine does. You're making melody, and he specified the instrument. You're making melody with your heart. Speaking, speech, what we sing from the material for our songs. The action of singing, not playing. And we make the melody with our hearts because it is a spiritual worship. And one of the things that becomes interesting is that in the times of the Old Testament, God over and over and over again said, you sing praise to me with harps and and." horns and different types of musical instruments that they had. And he, he commanded that. And he doesn't say a word about that type of music in his new covenant. And where does he say he condemns it? Where does it say thou shalt not use an instrument of music? Where did he condemn it? I'd like to have that one because that would work with us, won't it? He didn't do that. He, not so, he, he doesn't mind it. And there's a generation that will think like that, and all this stuff is just tradition, and they'll be singing with instruments of music. When the older people have died off, and their influence is no longer there. And we have to be centered. This word's not going to change because a generation or two dies off. This is what it says. And... That's what he binds. If I don't have other information that says this is how I want to be worshipped when you're coming together, then we're going to uphold that and we will exalt that. In another context, when they did have miraculous gifts, in 1 Corinthians 14, there would be, there would be songs that are people were inspired with a song to sing. As revelation was being given and more of teaching of God's word was being set forth, there would be, there'd be singing. But the point was, my attitude is I want the other people to be edified and they need to understand the words we're singing. So I will sing with the spirit. That means my spirit is engaged. I know what I'm singing. God may have given that inspiration to them. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with the understanding. That's not my understanding. I've already got that with my Spirit. It's your understanding. It's the people we're talking to. And the reason we see that is the context. Not because Greek language or, or something in the Greek that tells us that, or, or, or being prejudiced against things. It's just looking at what he's saying. So in verse 16, else if thou bless with the Spirit, how will he that filleth the place of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, saying he knoweth not what thou sayest? For thou verily give thanks well, but the other is not edified. So I will sing with my spirit with what it means, I will pray in the Spirit, I will pray with the understanding. It's the other person's understanding. 
If you were doing it in a tongue that they didn't understand, they wouldn't be edified. And therefore, that's not the type of singing we're going to do. And that goes with our prayers, when men offer prayers and people can't hear you. How are they edified? That's why men who lead this prayer, it's, it's, not, it's not to say, well, you've you, 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 you got to have a special way of doing it. It's the whole point. My heart's cared. I want the person on that back row to hear me. Well, they can't hear you anytime. You just try your best. Some people's hearing aids just don't work <laughs> very well. But the point is you want that possibility to be there. We have microphones to help that. But you speak out. And the reason you speak out is not, well, I just want to be heard. No, I want to be heard. I want to be understood. Because how would they say amen at the end of my prayer if they hadn't heard my petition? How can they do that? They can't. They can't. So I will sing where the other person understands. Because in verse 40, I let all things be done decently and in order. In our song service, even when we have different parts, a lot of times they're echoing the bass and the, and, and the soprano, the higher pitched voices are, are just echoing the thought there. They're not contradicting one another because our worship needs to be decently and in order. People understand the words we're saying. And that is an assembly of the church in Corinth when they had miraculous gifts. That would cause someone who's not a believer to come in and realize God is there. Because they're hearing prophecy that hits their heart. But if they're speaking in a tongue that, that nobody understands, then they'll think you're crazy. And nothing's going to be accomplished. In our assemblies of, of being together, there was this singing service. And there was singing that it wasn't well i have a choir tonight and we can sit and watch and listen i love music are oh, we got some people playing great on the guitar and all those things that's beautiful that's be your contemporary worship add that to it because people like to hear that god is the audience and all of us are participants and he's the one that we're to honor. So what do we do? We take his word. I know singing is right. And the only thing that I can think of is why God didn't say this is wrong when he hasn't authorized it. Is that when the priesthood changed, worship changed. And the priesthood changed. And God made us understand Jesus is the high priest now. And we offer up spiritual sacrifices now. It changed the whole nature of worship. We don't offer a physical sacrifice, do we? Our animals. Don't offer a meal offering from our grain. Jesus is that sacrifice that, that satisfied all the aspects of sacrifice in the Old Testament, especially redeemed us by his blood. We don't offer a lamb. Gold, ox. And when you change the nature of worship, that changed the instruments you used. And it was to be spiritual in its nature. And he specified that spiritual aspect of it. He didn't have to say, now don't use these other things. He didn't say sing and play. He said sing. And the worship comes. And when you read in the New Testament, I, mean, I know Paul and Silas are in prison. They couldn't play an instrument they wanted to that night. I understand that. But other places they could. And they've had it in the Old Testament. But when the New Testament church sings under the guidance of the apostles, it was completely not there. Because why? Worship changed when the priesthood changed. When the sacrifices changed because Jesus offered himself, he's the high priest, and he offered himself, he changed the whole nature of worship. And now will my people worship me like I want to be worshipped? He said, yeah, we will. We'll worship 
the Lord in, in singing. And when we come together, we'll be involved in singing to one another and edifying one another and making sure the other is edified by a decent order worship. What about our dress? Our dress is something we're in the world. And do you want to go without clothes all the time? You know, you can live in that world, I guess. But no, God clothes it. He clothed the first man and woman. They had fig leaves. He got them robes. And dress is something that is important because we have bodies and there's the sense of covering our bodies for you know, evident purposes. Not only for warmth and that thing, but, but those are, that's private. But when we speak about our dress, we realize, well, what did he bind? When God spoke on the subject of dress and tell us how to dress, what, what did he bind upon our hearts? 1 Timothy 2, 9 and 10, for example. In like manner that women adorn themselves, beautify themselves in modest apparel. Not just apparel, but modest apparel. With shamefastness and sobriety. It's not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly raiment, but through good works is how we read that, but there's a parenthetical statement that is characterized, is characterized in there. I've got the but through good works. So I'm going to see my good works, and I'm not going to pay attention to the outward adornment, though we'll talk about there's nothing wrong with paying attention to that. But the emphasis is they will see my good works, and I'll be dressing in such a way which becometh women professing godliness. That's what their heart is like. First Peter 3 and verse 3 and 4, that who's adorning, wives, women, who's adorning, let it not be the outward adorning of braided the hair, wearing of jewels, or putting on apparel. Does that say, well, you're not supposed to wear jewels? You're not supposed to braid your hair. If it does, you're not supposed to put, wear clothes. Because he, 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 he said that too. Well, no, no, we got to wear clothes. There's nothing wrong with the pearls and nothing wrong with the hair. It's the emphasis. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. In the incorruptible peril. Did you know that your inside is apparel as well with God? It's the incorruptible apparel of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Context, submit yourself to your husbands. That meek spirit that is quiet, it's not, it's, it's not in conflict with this idea of, of submitting to him. He has been delegated authority for being the head of his house. And you recognize that. You submit unto your husband as unto the Lord, Ephesians says. And I think sometimes when we get the idea, well, you know, he, who is he? Just another person. I've got to, I've got to submit to him. It's, it's, it's a delicated authority. wonder if one of your sons... You're having a party and you're having people drive to your house and, and you have one of your sons or your daughter and you have them standing out there. Now, uh, we need you to park over here behind the house. You need to drive your car over here. Uh, Y'all need to go over there. And they're out there directing traffic and you drive up. And say, hey, you're 12, 14 years old. Why do I have to listen to you? I want to park over. No, you need to drive over here and you need to drive over there. On that particular day, their daddy, who you're there as he's going to be the host of the party. Their daddy told them, would you direct the traffic? And why do you not get up? No, no 12, 14 year olds going to tell me what to do. I'll park my car where I want to. I'm an adult. You're not. You don't have that conversation. You recognize that's part of the family and that's what they want to do and you'll do it. You submit yourself to delegated authority. God has delegated the man to be the head of his house. 
And a man is not supposed to shirk that responsibility. He doesn't say, well, I'll get up to it someday. No, that's where God placed you. And he gave you instructions of how to treat your wife. First Peter 3 and verse 7. But the adornment that is of great price is that meek and quiet spirit, the chaste behavior will win that unbelieving husband if he's going to be one. And that meek and quiet spirit, that inward part of the person that's being emphasized, yes, you can pretty up. You can beautify. There's nothing wrong with that, but the emphasis is this our dress, when we do dress, will come from this type of heart. Again, it's a heart issue. And that's in play for every generation. Does God stress the style? It's the type of dress that he wants us to have and wear? Or does he address the heart? I think we can see it's the heart. The heart's connected with the dress. He says it's modest apparel. Modesty denotes order. But it's well arranged for the occasion. And there are occasions when certain dress there is appropriate. And we always have to make that decision. We talk a lot about men's dress. Wearing shorts that rise up over the thigh when you sit in a golf cart in the summertime and, and we have to make those judgments. People say, I don't have to worry about that. That's just foolishness. We'll wear what we want to wear. No, that's the world. And God has addressed that we want to avoid nakedness. And we read our Bibles and understand sometimes that nakedness is the thigh. Sometimes it's a revealing parts of our body that, that is kind of, kind of connected with nakedness. And we pay attention to that because God does. Would it be appropriate, and we'll just start this on a Sunday night because that's when people are more casual, and just have our men that wait on the table come in shorts that are go to the knee, and, and wear a, a nice, oh, collared shirt. That gets you on the golf course, and you, we're going to have that. And they wait on the table in their shorts. Would you call it modest apparel? It's got the knee covered. It's got clean clothes on. I'm going to offer thanks for the bread. Let's pray. That wouldn't be, well ordered for the occasion, even though it may be modest in some, in some ways. That's pretty good on the golf course, but here we're to worship God. We're to honor the Lord. We want to communicate to the world that this is something that is important. We do it every week, but it doesn't become commonplace. It's not something that's an empty habit. He deserves the best that we have. And what our culture says, that's the best. It's interesting to me that what preachers preach in now. And don't want to wear a suit. So wear a suit. You don't have to wear a suit. But even the people that are in denominations and so forth. I saw a video of a preacher that I look at some time. And he's not wearing a tie. He's not wearing uh, suits anymore. And I've looked at him from, from about 20 years past. And... I see that, but in this one video, he's wearing a suit. You know why? Because an hour before he preached that particular lesson, he did a funeral. He did a funeral. And he had a suit and a tie on. And he just came from the funeral home and got up there and addressed the audience. Well, he was dressed for the occasion to give honor for it. I'm not saying he's just, he's just honoring the Lord when he preaches. But we make judgments. And do we want to have a casual attitude toward the Lord's Supper, a casual attitude about what we're doing when we're preaching, or how we're dressing the world? It's going to be well arranged for the occasion. They're not going to be tight, but they may be longer than a dress. Because we're going to be climbing trees today. It might be better. 
that those legs are covered. But those are pants, you know, I know. But the point is, the styles are there, not there. And, but when we come to worship, we want to wear our best. Well arranged for the occasion. Modest apparel. Shamefastness. It's a word that we don't use much. We don't find it around much. But what it is, it's an attitude that shrinks back from crossing the line of impropriety. There comes a point when we realize that's shameful, that's immodest, that's, that's revealing, that, that is kind of suggesting type of dress. And you know when that line's hit because of the reaction it gets from the world. And what the heart of this being trained by God in his word, any society, is that I will shrink back from crossing that. I have a sense of shame of how my dress is affecting you. Just like my singing and my prayer and how it affects you. Do you understand it? And I don't want to cross the line that I would bring those stares of a boy or a young man because I'm not properly dressed. That would encourage the thoughts that are pure instead of impure. And you see that in exercises. You see that in track. You see that in all sorts of people. People are exercising and they, they wear their attire. And there's some men and women that run around the track, run around the lake, run around everything, and they don't care how they look. They sort of skimpy stuff. And I watch men who watch them, because my eyes are going to be there. And I watch men who watch them, and they stare, and they stare, and they stare. What's going through their mind? Well, you haven't left much to imagination. You've encouraged that stare. And what happens, a woman has that sense of shame, sense of shame and has the sobriety, the sober-mindedness and sound judgment to not wear that. Because you know how men are. You know how other people are. And what does he do? He doesn't address the style. He addresses the heart. What does God bind? Styles? Well, here's your first century dress. I don't see a woman looking like that this night. Do you? Well, no woman's going to wear a basket like that. <laughs> but the attire, is that modest? And a lot of people dress that way. Did God bind that in the first century when the Bible was, was, was produced? And therefore... These two women in the 17th century, just as evil as they can be. That's, that's immodest, really. It's not the same style. But that was the style of that day. What about the 20th century? And we're living in the 21st century. But here are two ladies out for tea. And the 20th century. Something immodest about them? We could put some pictures up here that she's, well, I don't know about that. That's, that might be a little risque there. And we may have our judgments about what is and what isn't. But no line of impropriety has been crossed. When we put into our heart that desire that we will dress properly. He doesn't bind the styles or we would be back in robes of the first century. But every culture, every society, every, the times that we live in, dress a changes. I've said it before. I grew up as a young man, married man, teenage man, Waiting on the table when hot pants was in style among brethren. Many skirts, maybe they wouldn't wear hot pants. That's what they'd wear to work. The world was. But our ladies were, were wearing mini skirts. And they got real many when you sitting down in a pew. 
And I don't know if we'll ever get back to normal, but that we passed down that plate down that aisle. We didn't just take it ourselves. And it was embarrassing. And then all of a sudden, styles changed. And those dresses went right to the floor because we're going to have maxi now. Not many. We're going maxi for a few years. Styles can change us, but God's word can't. And what are you doing, ladies? What are we doing, men? We are living in a world. We want to be in that world. We're not going to be conformed to that world. And we realize how God has bound his will to us. And so be not conformed to this world. How do I do that? I'm renewing my mind to be conformed to God's expressed will. In Romans, the 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, brethren, be by the mercies of God to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God with your spiritual service. Be not fashioned according to this world. How do I do that? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, the perfect, acceptable, perfect will of God. So that's how we do that. And so we look, what have you bound, God? What have you said that this is how I need to think the where I dress, the music I listen to, the TV shows I see, the movies I allow to come into my purview? He has talked about that. Resist only the changes of this world which contradict God's will. We live in this world. We may have pros and cons about the various things of media that we have at our disposal. World may be doing things that you wish that they get back and do it the old ways. And people will do things different ways. Things will change. But when things contradict God's word. And you're renewing your mind by the word of God. You will be able to make those things. That's where you draw the line. That's when you show. The heart of a godly woman. Professing godliness. And they'll see it in how you dress. How you talk, what you listen to, what you watch, what's good entertainment to you. Your character will be there. Remember, the heart and the character is regulated by God's word for all time. It doesn't change with styles. Styles is what makes us like the world. And there's parts of that that we're doing. I'm dressed in a suit and tie. You're dressed the way you are. Those styles will be changing. And there's nothing wrong with that. They will be changing. But when things contradict the revealed word of God, and it always will deal with that heart and that character, that's what goes through time. That's why he doesn't have to have volume two to the New Testament. He doesn't have to have an up-to-date like we had encyclopedias. It's always up to date. The modernity of the Bible. It's just another aspect of why I think it's written by God. Because we would get caught up in our styles. And he gives us some very broad areas. But he said, you respect my authority. You don't add to, you don't take away. And so we realize, hey, he's talked to my heart. He's talked to my character. I will recognize the difference. And when I do. And I want to follow God's way. It will always be for the benefit of the society we live in. Purity, godliness, edification, understanding the gospel of salvation. We can live in this world. We can influence it for good. That's what God wants us to do. While not being conformed to it. Oh, they may make fun of you. They may be mad at you. They may ostracize themselves from you. But you came in contact one time. They do know what a Christian looks like. And hopefully they will change their mind. But they'll never find someone better character. Living a better life. You know, because they know that godliness has the promise of the life that now is and that which is to come. And that's what you're offering people. And therefore your character needs to shine. A city set on a hill cannot be hid, neither can you. And you take that bushel off that light, you teach when you can, and you offer them the teachings of God's word. But that character in your heart will be seen, what you listen to, what you, recreation, 
All those little things that people know that you do. We can work on that and be the type of people that God would have us to be. Lesson is yours. This, this evening, you're not a Christian. Someone in the audience that haven't obeyed the gospel. I want to encourage you to use this time wisely and realize that we don't have another time. This may be it. And you have an opportunity to, to come to Christ and have your sins washed away by his blood through baptism. And we're here to assist you in that. If we can help you in any way, you come now as we stand and as we sing.